All right, first and second Thessalonians. This is the fourth lesson in the series, preparing for the second coming. The title of this lesson, Credentials for the True Church. And uh, if you're following along in your Bibles, we'll be um, in chapter four, first Thessalonians, and we'll get there in a minute. Do a little review. Those of you who may have not been here last time. So here are a couple of points about what we've been doing so far. First of all, the Thessalonian letters, the letters to this church were written by Paul to a young church that he had established in just a few weeks while on his second missionary journey through Macedonia. Imagine just a few weeks to establish a church, to teach it the basics, get them going. So he's writing them with instructions. We find out that this church had been faithful and growing despite the attacks on Paul by Jewish leaders and also persecutions by the pagan society in which they, in which they lived. Now, as you recall, the first epistle begins with Paul you know, expressing his thanksgiving for the Thessalonians' faith and perseverance. You know, I told you, nothing motivates a preacher more than seeing the church grow and you know, persevere through uh, difficult times. Then we notice that he defended his conduct among them by describing how true ministers are supposed to act, and this is how uh, or this is the way, rather, that he and his associates acted while around them. The reason for that is that he had been attacked by others. Others had kind of accused him of being some kind of charlatan, you know, doing this just for money. And so his response is, hey, <clears throat> th th these are the credentials of true ministers. Th this is how you judge a true minister. And he said that true ministers trust in God in their ministry. That's the very first criteria. Uh, they have a pure lifestyle, they work hard, and they love the church. You, you can't be successful in ministry if you don't love the church. If you don't love the church, you, know, you're, you, know, you're, you, it'll, <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> you can tell when somebody is working. In French we say contre car. Contre car means against one's heart. So you can tell when somebody is not in it anymore, you know, whether they love the church or not. And then in our last lesson I said that Paul the Apostle shows us that true conversion begins with sincere ministers who preach the truth in love to people who receive the message of God's word and they respond to it in faith and obedience. Nothing new there, I mean, you know, there's nothing new there, but he's, you know, he's going over with this young church what to look for in someone who is sincere and truthful in preaching the gospel to them and also going over with them, what does a, like a really faithful congregation look like? You know, what does it feel like? You know? So in the section that we're going to study today, we're going to look at some characteristics associated with the true church that belongs to Christ. So what is the, the true church? So we go to um, chapter four, beginning in verse one and two. Chapter four, beginning in verses one and two. He says, finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So in this passage here, the key word is the word continually. A lot of churches begin well, but they lack the desire to continue to purify and improve their conduct. That's why you know, when we had our 75th anniversary here of this congregation's founding, that's a marvelous thing. A lot of congregations don't last that long. You know, they start well, five years, 10 years, and then there may be some infighting or you know, population move or whatever, and they don't exist anymore. This congregation has managed to um, you know, persevere for 75 years. That's, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a blessing. Now, I want you to note also that Paul tells the church that he knows that they are living in a way that pleases God. And now he encourages them by the authority of Christ to continue to purify that lifestyle according to what he has and will teach them. Okay, now why give them this instruction? Why should he tell them to you know, keep on purifying your life? Why should, he, why should they do that? 
Well, the answer is they at that time lived among great temptation. And the only way to remain strong is to keep the commitment to continually strive to please God. It's like a sharks, you know, they got to keep moving. If, they stand, if they're still, they, they die. You know, it's the same thing with the church. Church, you got to keep moving. Because if the church isn't moving forward, then it's moving backwards. There's no standing still. That's just a rule of thumb. If the church isn't moving forwards, it means it's moving, it's moving backwards. So you know, some people, they get very tired of sermons and lessons encouraging the church to be careful, to work hard at improving, so on and so forth. But these type of lessons, are, are, they're necessary because only a firm commitment to continued growth and purity keeps us pure. Remember, that's what we're about, right? Purity. You know, uh, Paul uh, sent me a text the other day. He says, you won't believe this, what I just saw, you know, I don't know, on Facebook or something, you know, on the news. And there was a, you know, like we have a sign out here you know, where we put the sermon titles. Well, there was a church that had a sign that said, this Sunday, beer and hymns. Beer and hymns. It wasn't a joke. Beer and hymns. You know, what was it? Three, limit three drinks per person. And when you read the story, you know, the, the person who was there, the minister was there, we just, he said, we just want to have fun. We just, you know, we, we want people to have a good time and know that God is okay with having a good time. Really? So I don't know what all went into that decision. Boy, I would have liked to have been at the deacons meeting that decided that one. But imagine mixing the world, <laughs> mixing the world with worship. I mean, actually doing it on purpose. That particular group perhaps might need to read 1 Thessalonians. It, it might do them some good to think about that. So uh, impure and uncommitted churches, they don't have any power. That's the problem. They have no power to win souls to Christ and they risk losing their own spiritual health. That's the reason. Why do we go forward? Well, we want power. Why do we purify ourselves? We want spiritual power. We want to have the power so that our witness makes a difference. That's why we continue to do this and knowing that it's pleasing to God. So Paul did not want this to happen to the Thessalonians. They live in a pagan society. They're under pressure all the time. And basically his message is the best defense is offense. Instead of just fighting everything off, you know, move forward in your, 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 your desire to, to purify your lives and so on and so forth. So he gives them three areas where they needed to purify their lives. Remember, a young church, they're doing great, they're hanging in there. Now he gets very surgical, very specific about how they need to purify their lives. First of all, he says, they need to work on spiritual purity. So in verse three he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now the idea of sanctification means to set something aside, not just to set something aside, but to set something aside for godly use. Okay, that's why people say, how come we don't do all kinds of stuff in the auditorium and throw footballs around and it's empty? And it, well, because we've kind of set that place aside to worship God. There's nothing holy about the benches or anything like that. It's the purpose. We have taken that space and say, in that space, you know, we worship Almighty God. So you know, we've kind of, we've kind of, that's just what we do in that. Now in this space, we eat, we do what we need, we have you know, fellowship nights, all kinds of stuff. You know? But over there, you know, more, you know, that, that space is set aside. Well, sometimes it's not a space or a thing. Sometimes it's a person. So when we become Christians, what happens is that God sets us aside for a special, a special purpose. Our physical bodies are sanctified. They're set aside for God's use. You know, bodies that belong to God are to be used to glorify Him, period. That's the, yeah. If you were a mechanic when you became a Christian, you're still a mechanic after you're a Christian, but now your body has been set aside in order to honor God. 
So sexual immorality, he uses one term, includes adultery, homosexuality, pornography, lewdness, evil desires, the whole thing. Those type of activities do not glorify God. Now I could go in and you know, psychologically talk about the harm that pornography does, it's incredibly addictive and so on and so forth, you know, all the problems that people have become addicted to all that. But you know what, instead of talking about the harm it does to you, just flip it over on the positive side. Consuming pornography does not glorify God. And we have been set aside to glorify God, period. There's one argument that you know, is airtight. Now if you extend this thought, you see that God wants total sanctification for His church. Now sanctification doesn't mean that we, can, we are to have no sex life. That's, you know, some people have taken that idea way too far. It means that even our sex life is under His control and for His glory. Because after all, He's the one who invented it. So when a husband and wife are expressing their love and desire within the intimacy and the boundaries of marriage, God is glorified. Why? Because we're using this human activity in the way God designed it, so therefore that glorifies, that glorifies God. And activities outside this blessed state dishonor God and the individuals. And of course, this is something that a non-believer can't even grasp. I mean, you know, you're, talking, you're, you're talking to a wall when you're talking this type of language to someone who has no commitment to Christ, someone who has you know, absolutely you know, no spiritual value, so on and so forth. Why, why should I restrain myself from consuming whatever I want sexually? And the answer is, yeah, why? <laughs> Unless you're a Christian, yeah, why, why? Then you have to go, well, it could be harmful, it's not a good example, you know, blah, blah, blah. So let's read four and five. He says that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. So Paul says that the way to achieve this, remember we're talking about sexual purity here, the way to achieve this is to continually struggle for the ownership of our own bodies. Who owns your body? If you say, I do, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> the right answer is, God owns my body. He owns me. I love that old, old Bob Dylan song, you know, when Bob Dylan had a little flirtation with Christianity for a time. If you're old enough, you remember that. He came out with some Christian type songs for a while. But he did write a, a good song that, that was entitled, Everybody's got to serve somebody. And in that song he said, you know, you're either serving God or you're serving Satan. There is no choice. There's no middle ground. No truer statement was said. So to control our sexual impulses, because everyone's got them. I know we're dressed for church, but we all have sexual impulses. So to control our sexual impulses so that they can be expressed in meaningful and acceptable ways, this is what honors God. That you resist something that is not acceptable to God, the fact that you resist that, this honors God. Because at that moment in time you're saying no to this thing, whatever it is, I'm saying no to this thing, why? Because my body wants it, my mind wants it, so on, my soul wants it, but in my spirit I know that God doesn't want me to do this thing. So I will deny myself in order to honor God. Paul says, not behaving like those who do not know God and allow their bodies to be used by every devilish passion they feel, the effort to do that, this honors God. And I can tell, he doesn't say it here, but I can tell you that when you do that, the next feeling is peace, joy. You know, you, you've been in the battle. And the other side of the battle is that peace and that joy that comes. And when we give in to the temptation, what is the following thing as a Christian? Psh, regret, guilt, oh, I did it, no, I don't want to do that, blah, blah. shame. So we can and of course we should marry, but Paul says that there's a way to do it which is right and pleasing to God. Sexuality was given by God to mankind, but God also gave laws to guide our natural sexuality in such a way 
that this powerful force will bless mankind and not destroy mankind, and honor God rather than dishonor God. So the first thing he says to the church, you're doing good, you're persevering, we really appreciate your faith. Okay, take it a step further. I want you now to begin purifying your life. You know? And the first thing you need to do in that is to purify your sex life. Then he talks about purifying your business life. Integrity in business. Verse six, he says, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you. A little background here, the pagan world of the first century was notable for two vices in particular, sexual immorality and unchecked greed. Thessalonica, that city, was a large trading and business center. So a lot of the members of the church at that time were involved in trade. They were in business in one way or another. So without the laws and the checks and balances of our system, unsavory and unscrupulous business practices were the norm at that time. You had a really buyer beware in the first century, boy, in capital letters. So Paul doesn't go into details or examples. He simply warns them of the consequences of violating another person in these kind of matters. When he says brother here, brother in the sense of neighbor and not brother like a brother in Christ. Okay? Now some individuals interpret this verse here in another way, and I've, I've read books about that, read commentaries, and they say that Paul in this verse here is simply continuing his warning about sexual sins warning that men in the church not commit adultery with each other's wives. I've seen that particular kind of interpretation. Um, of course, that's a true idea. You know, brothers shouldn't commit adultery with sisters you know, in, the, in the Lord, of course. But that idea does not fit well what Paul is saying here and how he's expressing himself. The word matter, you know, he says, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter the word matter is a commercial term, which literally means a business matter or matters of commerce. So this was a, an, an evident problem in pagan society and Paul makes reference to it. Apparently Paul has warned them of this before and he repeats his warning that even these violations will not go um, unpunished. So let's go to verse seven and eight. He says, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So Paul summarizes you know, the first two admonitions, you know, a greater effort at purifying sexual and business lives. He kind of summarizes those things and he explains to them why they should do this. Why should they do this in these two areas? And first of all, he says, because you guys, you're new creatures, he says. In Christian baptism, we bury the old, pagan, unclean, impure, greedy, dishonest person, and we resurrect a completely new person. That new person is sanctified. That new person is now going to be set apart for a different purpose. This new life has a different focus, a new purpose, even a new set of guidelines. We don't live like people in the world who have no faith live. We don't live that way, we just don't. So he says to them, this new life that you have, this new life is about purity in thought and in deed. This new life is about a continual effort to strain out what is impure and ungodly. You know, this business of you know, uh, you've, got to, you've got to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, be baptized, confess Christ, be baptized. You know, and then, uh, and then that's how you become a Christian. And yes, that is how you become a Christian. Yes, that's fine. Now, uh, there's only one thing that doesn't continue on there, and that's baptism. You do that one time. You, know, you, do, you do it the right way one time. You know, the right way by immersion for the right reason. But that's the only quote thing that's just one time. Because everything else in those five you know, things continues. I continue to hear the gospel. I continue to believe and expand my ability to believe. I continue to confess Christ, you know, as I'm doing now, 
as all of us do in our, I continue to do that. And I continue to repent. Repentance isn't a one-time thing, it's a lifelong experience. There's no sanctification without repentance. There's no growth in Christ without repentance. Be happy, I've told you this before, be happy when the Spirit of God points out to you in your heart, in your mind, something that's got to go in your life, whatever that is. Don't get mad, don't get defensive, be happy because you are being invited to take a step up in your spiritual life. And there's always a reward, always a reward. And so Paul is telling them, you're new creatures. This is, your, this is what your life is about. We're saved because God loves us. We're sanctified because God has a purpose for our lives, which Paul is going to explain in the next section, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But here, why continual purification? Well, the second reason is you're going to be judged. The this that Paul refers to is God Himself. The one who rejects, in other words, the one who sets aside or annuls or puts aside not just a lifestyle, but also the very God who gives this lifestyle of sanctification, gives this lifestyle of ongoing purification, powered by and made possible by the Holy Spirit, who is given for this very purpose. He said, boy, the person that puts all this aside is going to be in trouble as far as judgment is concerned. In chapter 5, 19, Paul will say, do not quench the spirit, do not despise pro prophetic utterance. Remember when I was talking to you about ongoing repentance? Every time you say no to repentance, not now, tomorrow, whenever, every time you say no to that, in effect what you're doing is quenching the spirit. You're just dampening down the power of the spirit in your, in your life. And so here Paul cautions that to deny or ignore God's word has the effect of extinguishing or suffocating the power of the Spirit within Christians. Dave was talking about, well not talking about, in his prayer this morning, he was, you know, he was praying for many things, but he prayed especially for brothers and sisters for whatever reasons who are not able to come. Now many are ill, of course, and many work different shifts, we, we, you know, we get that. But some people just made the decision this morning, you know what, I'm just not going to go. I'd rather just stay in bed. You know. So you have three opportunities today to hear God's word, to have the Spirit work on you, and for some reason you've just said, nah, I'd rather watch the game that I taped last night, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever reason. So Paul is saying, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't put all that aside. Don't let the world fill up that space there. So in this chapter, Paul is saying the same thing, except that the extinguishing of the Spirit and his effect on us is done by not pursuing purity, by rejecting the sanctified life that God offers us in exchange for I'd rather be in the world. Because every person I've ever kind of visited, because they, you know, I don't mean you go, you're gone for a week or two, three weeks, everybody's got stuff to do, but you know, a couple of months has gone by, not even shown up at church and we don't know why. Every time I go visit that, I always find, always, there's always something underneath and usually the something underneath, if it isn't some sort of critical illness or something we didn't know about, usually is something sinful, <laughs> usually. Because the person says, you know what, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm into gambling, whatever, you know, let's just pick something out of the air, okay? Because I'm sure nobody here ever does that. So. So I'm into gambling. So what's hard is if I'm at the casino all afternoon, you know, playing the dollar machine, it's very hard for me to come to church the next day and hear about purity and sanctification and devotion to God. It's just hard. If I'm sleeping with my boyfriend you know, every weekend, you know, if I'm a young woman and I'm sleeping with my boyfriend every weekend, blah, 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 it's very hard to come to church, uh, come to a class like this and have the, one of the teachers say, you know what? Brothers and sisters, let's, let's really focus on sexual purity. Let's really make that an issue and in our lives. Let's fight for it's important. Man, you don't want to hear a message like that over and over and over again. Eventually something's got to give. The boyfriend or the Lord. You know, I mean, it's just the way it works. So he doesn't spell it out, but the end of the matter is plain. He says, woe to the one who rejects God and the spirit-empowered life he offers in order to pursue the old life of, in this case, sexual impurity and 
worldly greed, dishonesty. And we know that these things can bring very real physical consequences. You know, hey, sexual diseases, all kinds of stuff, unwanted pregnancies, guilt, depression, enslavement, undepraved habits, revenge on the one we cheat. Never talk about that, but you know. I talk to these old boys who've gone through a divorce, you know, all of a sudden they decide, yeah, I don't love her anymore, I don't feel like being a dad anymore, I'm out of here, gone, you know. Freedom, you know, and that lasts for about six months, you know. and then after that it's, what have I done? What have I just done? <laughs> I've just dejected me out of my life. So there are always, there's always regrets for sin. For Christians, you know, the people out there, they can sin all they want, you know what I'm saying, and have their way of repressing the guilt that they feel, but not us, not us. So, yes, there are physical consequences, but Paul adds to these that there is also spiritual consequences to these things, and he warns those who have been saved from the terrible spiritual consequences, don't go back to that life. Okay, so let's remember what's going on in this chapter. I've kind of diverged a little bit here and there. Paul is talking to the Thessalonians and he tells them that there are three things that they need to work on in order to continue the purification process. One, purify their sexual lives. Two, purify their business dealings. And then thirdly, purify your public witness. Now usually our sexual sins are done in secret, unless you're on Facebook and you blab, okay? But usually those things are done in secret. Most people really cannot tell if we're sexually pure or not. If we consume porno pornography, let's just say, that doesn't show on your face. You, know, that you can't tell that. Most folks assume that we are and, should, you know, and they're shocked if they find out any different. Listen, you know, how many guys you know, uh, 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 use pornography or you know, they, they bust them because of child porn or whatever? Never makes the newspapers, never. But if, uh, if the guy happens to be a deacon in XYZ church, or worse still, a minister, how about that guy, you know, for, we won't mention names here, but the, just recently, the big blow up, he was a representative on one of the big uh, college campuses representing a Christian group and he got busted for pornography or something like that. That made the news. Not because of what he did, because of who he was. That's what was newsworthy. Amazing. Because the, know, the world always knows how Christians ought to act. Even though they act like that all the time, they know how we ought to act and they call us on it when we don't act in the way that we should. So Paul is saying, purify your public witness. And greed, you know, that's something we try to cover up or justify in various ways as well. So Christians can hide these things, these kinds of sins from other people, but the ability to hide our sins from others does not give us the power in affecting them for Christ. It only fools others into thinking we sinc we're sincere when actually we're not. So what affects people for Christ, however, is Christian living a purified life and doing it openly and consciously. Now, if others don't see this, they're not going to be impacted by our message. You know, it's one, I, I, again, I picked the same thing. One of the reasons that I gave up tobacco. I had all kinds of reasons to keep on going. Ah, it's not so bad, I'll cut down, I'll do it moderately. But aside from the health and the addiction hazards, I know that non-Christians are not very impressed with a Christian who is a moderate or social user of tobacco. Why? They expect better. They think we ought to be better, even though they may have a mouthful of chew and the spit cup. I don't know how those guys get girls. This is, I don't get that part, you know, but anyways. I never understood that. But you know what I'm saying. Or a big package of cigarettes over here, a cigar in their mouth. You know, and I'm thinking, people in the world do it, but if they see us do it, they're usually disappointed. I, I've never seen a person have a Bible, I've never seen a Christian have a Bible study with someone in with a full ashtray. <laughs> Cigarette? Yeah, sure, hey, can you light me up? Okay, let me tell you about Jesus. Uh-uh, 
It, it doesn't work, right? And I picked that because that's an easy one, right? So in the final section, we see Paul establishing kind of new goals for them to strive for in the addiction, or in the addition rather, to the faithfulness and the perseverance that they've already demonstrated. So here's the last thing he says, so he says, now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel, um, uh, to excel still more. He's already taught them the basic lessons of Jesus, which is to love one another. They've already demonstrated faith and perseverance, hospitality. They've helped the brethren throughout the province so that they're, you know, they're known as a loving church. Did you know that's what we're known for? All those, you know, those summer speakers that came in, those guest speakers that came in, the feedback that I got from them all the time is, you guys have the most friendly church, the kindest, loving church, you know, blah, blah. and it's not, they're not just blowing smoke there, because these guys speak at a lot of places. They don't, they don't need to say that. And the thing they always comment on is, boy, it's like you know, seven to eight worship service, it's like five after nine, there's still people talking to each other in the foyer. We have to kind of, right, you deacons have to kind of lock the doors, you have to push them out, come on, go already, flash the lights, go home, people. And what's interesting is that usually the guest speaker is one of the last guys to leave because people want to talk to him and tell him what a great job he did and so on and so forth. So Paul says, you know, Keep doing these things. Their witness within the church was excellent, but now he says, uh, he deals with what their witness of daily living should be in order to affect not people within the church, but the people on the outside of the church. So in verse 11 he says, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. So he gives them three things, excuse me, three things that are essential in order to leave a uh, what is a balanced life which will provide a good witness to others on the outside of the church. Did you notice he doesn't say here, make sure you quote the scripture to everybody you see. Make sure you pound them over the head with the gospel every time you have a chance. Didn't say that. See, you want to have a good witness. Number one, he says, lead a quiet life. That doesn't mean no excitement, no action. Anybody who has little kids know that <laughs> You can't lead a quiet life if you have children, but it refers to a quiet spirit, a calm heart, uh, uh, not a wearisome and worrisome attitude. You know, some people love drama, <laughs> right? They love, they're like a vortex, you know, and if you get close to them, you know, you get sucked into their drama vortex. And so what he's saying is, Lead a quiet life. Not everything in your life is a big deal for everybody else. A quiet life is one where it is evident that God is in control of your life. That doesn't mean no problems. It doesn't even mean no sharing of problems. But you know what I'm talking about. Some people, man, there's always a problem. There's always a, an explosion. Secondly, he says, attend to your own business. Mind your own business. A quiet heart usually minds its own business. And I think we call this virtue discretion. Someone whose life is not always spilling over into everybody else's life. Someone who is not always trying to become part of your life and everything in your life. And thirdly, he says, work with your own hands. This expression does not refer to manual labor exclusively. It means that your own hands or your own work supports you. That's what that means. If you're worried, if you're minding everybody else's business, you don't have time to take care of your own business. Christians should earn their own living and quietly mind their own affairs and live with security and peace of mind. Because if you don't have that, what good's your witness? If your life is filled with drama, how, how, how powerful, who, you're going to share your faith, the other person is going to say, wait a minute, I don't want your life. If that's what your religion has done to you, I don't want it. Uh-uh. So in verse 12, 
He says, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be any, in any need. So he explains why. Christians are to model a balanced, quiet, fruitful life as an alternative to the fretful existence that many non-believers live. And secondly, remain independent. Live this way so they don't become a burden on society. There's nothing worse than Christians who are supported by a non-Christian society because the Christian refuses to work. Nothing against social programs, nothing against helping someone who has a problem, absolutely not, because all of us need help from time to time. But there's no worse witness than a Christian who actually refuses to work and lives off of, you know, lives off of Caesar's money. That's not a great, that's not a great witness. So Paul recognizes the progress of this young church. He commends them for their growth. He encourages them to continually purify their lives by maintaining sexual purity, being upright and honest in their business affairs, and establishing quiet, balanced, and productive lives. And in doing these things, he says, they're going to cooperate with the purifying work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, and they will not be afraid of judgment. Why? because they will avoid judgment. I keep telling people, when you came out of the waters of baptism, you've just avoided judgment. Some people are, you know, they're Christians, they're thinking, oh, what's going to happen at judgment? Well, nothing for you. Your judgment's already been done. When? Well, when you said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you were buried in the waters of baptism, that was your judgment. That was your judgment. You're done. That's why you shouldn't be afraid of the judgment. God has already judged you and said, yeah, you've been faithful. You, you've, you've believed in Christ. So in doing this thing, they're going to cooperate with the Spirit and they will also provide an example of what the true church looks and acts like in providing a powerful witness for Christ. And this, of course, if you do this, I'll say one other thing, this will prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And in our next lesson, we're going to get into that, that whole idea, okay, what's going to happen when Jesus comes? Because Paul is going to turn his attention to that question. What's going to happen when Jesus comes? All right, that'll be it for this time. Thank you very much for your attention.